God raised, sheds, pours his blessing on us. I think about that every day. How God has poured his blessing on you. When we're faithful to him, we hear his voice and we want to follow him. He is our example. God is our example. And I thought about that, that he is our example, and to put these qualities into our character that Jerry just read. Meekness, temperance, Jack, all these good qualities that God wants to have, that we put in our character. If we are to go to heaven, we will need these qualities in our life. Amen? So we need a life of generosity. Generosity is not about what's in your bank account. It's about what's in your heart. Isn't that good? Generosity is not about what's in your bank account. It's what's in your heart. I want the last check I write to bounce. You ever have anybody say that? The last check I write in my life, I want to bounce. This is what, this is what a billionaire said. He said, I want the last. Charles F. Finley, who made his fortune in the duty-free shopping industry and began secretly giving his money away in 1984. His goal was to make a difference in the world while he was alive. And that's what yours should be and mine should be. While we're alive, we are to make a difference in the world. He's given more than $8 billion away to charitable organizations around the world. He's given a chunk of money, hasn't he? So what is generosity? The word generosity is not found in a lot of places. A lot of places it says goodness. And you read it in our translation of the Bible. And, and um, it says some of the qualities, goodness. But goodness is often misunderstood as the absence of evil. But in the Bible, goodness is not an absence of anything. It is the presence of something good. Isn't that good? We know that through the outflowing of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what's in your heart comes out. Comes out. It's also true that through the outflowing of the heart, we will act in one way or another. And if goodness is present in our hearts, that goodness will manifest itself in a generous spirit, in the words we say, in the way we treat others. So if you want to be a good person and you want to be a generous person, you will treat others kind. You'll be good to them. You'll be generous to them. When you see a lady or a man can't get through the door of the shopping uh, store, uh, the store, you'll open the door. You'll help them uh, get their groceries. You'll help them lift their uh, cat food on their cart, like I've seen. They've done that for Phyllis. Dog food. Whatever you're buying that's heavy, The generous person gives others the benefit of the doubt and treats others with respect. He or she isn't worried about what the act of giving may cost in terms of time or effort. He or she doesn't wait to be asked and doesn't expect anything in return. In other words, if I help you, then you've got to help me. That's the way the world is today. And I expect you to help me first. Most of us equate generosity with financial giving because that's what we hear about. That's what catches our attention. But generosity has a much fuller definition than just money. Respect, courtesy, forbearance, patience, all of these are the expressions of a generous spirit. 
Did you get that? Respect, courtesy, forbearance, patience. All of these are expressions of a generous spirit. Each day we are given opportunity to exercise generosity of spirit, to respond to impatience with patience, to reply to a hurried or thoughtless comment with an expression of understanding or empathy, to overlook what you don't like in someone so that you can seek and find out what you do like in them. I've heard many people say, I don't like him. I don't like the way he talks. I don't like this. We need to look and see what we do like him. And you'd be surprised there, there will be something in everybody you will like. You know that? There's something in everybody you like. And if you look and capitalize on that something that's good, pretty soon these other things you didn't like, goes away. Goes away. And you say, you know, I like that individual. You know, that person may have a few things I don't like, but I really do like that person because God made that person. And who am I to judge that person's no good? Who am I to say, I don't like that person? Because God died for that person, so God likes them. And if he's given every breath to live today and tomorrow. Who am I to say, that person's no good? <laughs> this doesn't mean you tolerate everything that comes your way. It means you seek to understand first and react later. And the first part of understanding is remembering that we're all humans. And we're all in this together. Open your heart to generosity and you'll be amazed how God will fill it. We're all in this church together. We're all sitting here together today. What does that tell you? We're united. If we're not, we should be united under the banner of Jesus Christ. We're all witnesses for him, either for good or bad. And I always say to the Lord, help me be a good witness. I pray every day for the Lord to give me a witness, especially when I get out on the road like I am every week and be a good witness. Help me uplift somebody. Help me be generous to them. Help me be respectful and kind to them. And help me show a smile on my face. So many people are like them. Mmm. 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 Oh, it's a hard road I got to do today. Oh, it's a hard road. I'm living a hard road. You know, I can mimic a lot of people the way they talk. I can mimic the way they walk. And so, sometimes if you was around me at home, you'd see it. I don't dare come out in the public and see it. Anyway, we need to look at others uh, uh, and respect them. For most of us, generosity doesn't come naturally. As children, we're fiercely protective of our toys. And what is our toys? Mm, our cars, our house. Whoa, our money. I had one person say, don't talk about people's kids or their wife or husband, or you'll get in trouble. And I didn't take that advice 40 years ago. And I did that. Wow, did I get in trouble. Did I get told where to be? Mm. As teenagers, we're more interested in fairness than benevolence. As adults, we're often so weighed down in financial worry, we, can't find, we can find it difficult to be open-handed with what we have. As adults, we often weigh down with financial worry, we can find it difficult to be open-handed with what we have. But like every virtue in the Bible, generosity is one we can decide to cultivate. And we can depend on God to help us. It's a virtue that we can put in our lives. It may be difficult. But I'll guarantee you that if you ask God 
to help you to put these virtues in your character. God will help you. And folks, if we don't do it, are you expecting to get to heaven? Are you expecting to get to heaven? If we don't put these good virtues in our lives, folks, He is our example. Amen? I've heard people say that all my life. God is our example. I don't hear it much anymore. So I guess I'm going to have to talk it more. The Apostle James said, Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. James 1.17. And I thought this morning when I got up and looked out and it had rained and we had over an inch, I said, thank you, Lord. I got on my phone. Jerry, I'm starting to use my phone more. Did you hear that? I got on my phone and went into the library, into my office, and I said, David, it rained last night. He said, praise God for it. Because I knew he needed rain to sow. Because he started sowing that day in the dry. Basically, we had a little rain that night. Just rained a little bit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Generosity is a discipline that is more caught than taught. Whoa, it's caught. In other words, I see you being generous. I see Dan being generous. And I said, I want to be like Dan. Don't we act that way a lot of times? I want to be like so-and-so. I'll use Dan for, for his name because it comes so easy to me. I had, a, I had an uncle that's named Dan. <laughs> we understand it's most when we see it in operation. Two of the best examples of generosity is in action can be found in the New Testament. Both takes place during the week before crucifixion, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Both takes place within this week. And in the first, we find Jesus sitting near the temple treasury, observing people as they give their offerings. Orville Hansen did that this morning. Sit up here and I observe people giving their offerings. Not the fine fault or nothing. Just sitting there. That's what Jesus was doing. Sitting there observing what people was giving. Yes. One, the, on this particular day, Jesus watched many people cast in large amounts of money to be seen and heard by others. But then a poor widow came in and quickly, or quietly, I mean, quietly made her meager offering. Gave her meager offering. In Greek, the word we translate as poor is the word used to describe someone who is destitute, a beggar. You've seen beggars, haven't you? I tell you folks, just go to Oklahoma City. If you want to see beggars, go down to MacArthur Street. Tuesday, I came by there. Listen to this. Here was one holding a sign and had it upside down. I said to Mike, it's upside down. And he didn't catch the point. What's upside down? What's upside down? That's what he did. You know the way he did. He didn't see the card right away. It's upside down. Well, he had good intent on it. He's wanting something. But anyway, in our day, this widow might be someone depending on public assistance or for survival or even someone who is homeless. Mm, homeless. In spite of her poverty, this woman wanted to give. Some people avoid generosity because they have much and want to keep it all for themselves, while others hide behind having too little. This poor widow did not hide behind her poverty. Out of her love for God, she gave what she had. She gave what she had. And that caught Jesus' attention. She gave what she had. That's what we should do. Give what we have. Give. In our story, Jesus tells us specifically what the poor widow gave. Two mites. Two mites. The word mites translated the Greek word is L-E-P-T-A. Dan, Dan is a Greek man. He knows Greek. 
And this word then, I'm sure you understand, L-E-P-T-A. The smallest dominion of coin minted in the Greek world. In the economy of that day, it was worth about how much? It was worth one one hundred and twenty of a day's pay. One slash one two eight. Uh, one one hundred and twenty eight. Not enough to buy a stale loaf of bread. That the wit widow's places to these coins. She could have kept one for herself. She does not. Never one to waste a teaching moment. Jesus said to his disciples, this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury, for they all put in out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had. It's like going someplace and, and, and you only have two or three pennies, one penny. I've been that way. Oh, I'm one penny short. And the clerk says, oh, we got a little cup up here. We got a few pennies. We'll, we'll pay you that penny. We'll give you that. Have you ever had that done? I've had it done many times. I'm always short. <laughs> One penny. <laughs> she gave all she had. Her whole livelihood. G. Camel Morgan wrote this. It is an amazing thing. About God, talking about God and his math. He did not say this poor woman had done splendidly. He did not say this poor woman had cast in very much. He did not say she had cast in as much as anyone else. He did not say she had cast in as much as a whole of them. He said more than all. Presiding over the temple coffers that day, the Lord of the temple took the gifts and sifted them. On the one hand, he put the gifts of the wealth on the, and the gifts of others. And on the other, two mites more than all. We should not read into this that all the wealthy donors of that day were evil. Surely some came with the right heart and gave for the right reason. To honor God and to contribute to the upkeeping of the temple and the welfare of the, their community. But while Jesus saw that day was the opposite, he saw those who gave for show, motivated by pride and desire to be recognized and applauded. In human terms, their gifts totaled more. But in God's sight, that total was less valuable than those two meager coins. But in God's sight, that total was less valuable than those two meager coins. I read it wrong. This. Jesus indicated that the thing of the most important is not how much is given, but the extent to which the gift is a sacrificial one. A major element of Jesus' teaching is that attitude is more important than action. I like that. Your attitude, your intent is more important. The widow's total giving demonstrated an attitude of absolutely trust in God. She trusted God that she'd give all she had, he would give her more. That somebody would give her some food that day. You understand? That somebody would come on, and I, I'm sure they would. Because God, when we're faithful to God, he will be faithful to us, and he, he will honor our prayer, folks. He will honor your commitment to him. I am absolutely confident in that. Our second story takes place in the village of Bethany, the town where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. On this occasion, a supper was hosted in the house of Simon the leper. No doubt a man Jesus had healed from leprosy, and Jesus was guest of honor. Matthew, Mark, uh, Mark and, Luke, and John all record how during dinner, a woman interrupted the proceedings as an act of generosity that may at first amaze us as much as amazed the folks that was there. According to John's account, Lazarus' sister Mary, who could only be found sitting at Jesus' feet as he taught, took a pound very costly oil, anointed 
the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. She had long hair, didn't she? And the house was filled with the fragrance. The disciples murmured about this. Oh, why would she spend so much on this little thing? So much just to do that to his feet. One of them was so incensed that he spoke up. And who do you think that was? Judas, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300, whatever it is, and given to the poor? The word is D-E-N-A-R-I-I. -I. Ben, you're going to help, help, have to help me with that. Denari. A day's wage. Why wasn't it get, you know, used for that? This is said not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in. Well, how much did that amount to? How much do you think that amount to? According to my notes here, it's $25,000 on someone's feet. I can kind of a little bit see why he would speak up. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's quite a bit. It, it would shock you. So, so if you use human math, it's a shocking gesture. But remember, God's math defines anything we know about numbers. It may not make sense to us, but Jesus understood it, and it made sense to him. Jesus looks at the heart. Jesus looks at your heart and my heart. And sees what we really are made of. You know? Are we honest or just for show? Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why, why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my barrel. Truly, I tell you, whenever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will, will also be told in memory of her. Mark 14, 6 and 9. Jesus knew the fate that awaited him. What a gift it must have been for him. What generosity. What goodness. What kindness. To experience the anointing of Mary gave. gave. It was Yet another sign that God would be with him throughout the coming trials and torture. His father would be with him. Jesus had complete confidence in his father in heaven that he would take care of him on earth. How about you and me? Do we have complete confidence that Jesus, our heavenly father, will take care of us through the coming days? Or are we laying in bed at night worried of what's coming on in this world. You know? All you have to do is look at your phone and whatever, and you'll see that trouble is looming. Put your trust in Jesus and tell others. By ourselves, these two acts of radical, spontaneous generosity challenges my heart and challenges your heart, I'm sure. Then we see them against the backdrop of the culture in which they took place. And the impact is even greater. <clears throat> in the Roman world, generosity was regarded as virtue reserved for the rich and the powerful. To be generous in the Roman world meant you had a good beginning. In other words, your parents were rich. Roman generosity was, was for the elite. Do we see that today? In fact, their culture depended on it. The wealthy acted as patrons, playing the work of the artists, aristocrats, as well as commissioning public works. However, unlike our definition of generosity, which expects nothing in return, wealthy Roman citizens were compensated for the strain on their bank account. Interesting. 
Do we have that today? Hey, if you give a huge amount to the church, you can take it as a deduction on your income tax, folks. Did, did anybody know this? I expect next week we'll have a lot bigger of an offering. Yeah? <laughs> if you didn't know it, yeah. You can take, a, take it off as a deduction. So you sure make sure you keep track of everything you give because you can take off more on your taxes. <sighs> this could take the form of giving preferral businesses arrangement, promoting a patron for political office, advocating for laws favoring the patron, or championing a beneficial benefactor civil status. Come to think of it, it's not unlike America today. Neither Mary nor the widow who gave all she had in the temple could have been expected to be generous. They both were swimming upstream against the culture and customs of their day. As Americans, we like to pat ourselves on the back that we are the most generous nation in the world. Our government does give away a lot of money. Like one man said, <laughs> he said, I don't mind paying taxes if I knew what nation gets it, what country goes to. They were both, uh, um, excuse me, our government does give away a lot of money. Generous nations are made up of generous people, and it may shock you to learn that more than 85% of Americans give less than 2% of their income. Wow, that is catchy. And numbers uh, for Christians don't make much difference that they found out. According to a recent study, only 10 to 25% of the people in the typical American congregation tithe. Did you get that? Only 10 to 25 percent pay tithe. The biblical 10 percent. The same report concluded that if the remaining 75 to 90 percent of the American Christians began to tithe regularly, global hunger, starvation, and death from preventable disease could be would go uh, would go away within five years. Additionally, literacy could also be eliminated. The world's water and sanitation issues could be resolved. All overseas mission work could be fully funded, and the more, uh, catch this, more than a hundred billion per year would be left over. If everybody would die, pay for it. If this is true, why is generosity so hard? And how do we cultivate it in our lives? The story is told of a pastor. Uh, it was kind of a small church. And he said, you know, if we want to get anywhere, we need to walk. And the gardener would say, Pastor, let us walk. And he said, if we want to get somewhere and, and evangelize this world, let us run. And the congregation said, let us run, Pastor. Let us run. And he said, if we really want to get somewhere, we got to fly. And the congregation said, fly, Pastor, fly. And the pastor says, if you got to fly, it's going to cost you. And the congregation said, let us crawl, Pastor. Let us crawl. A lot of talk, but no action. A lot of talk, no action. We need to have action in our lives. We need to change the way we think about money. We need to change. And the most vital step we take toward a generous spirit is turning the way we think about money on its head. When we remember that every good, good, good gift and every perfect gift is from above. James 1.17 we realize that nothing good is really ours to start with. I know I've told this to Phyllis many times. Everything I have comes from God. So when you married me, 
You got God's goodness. God gave my life, gave me my life, everything. And when I got her as wife, it was God's gift to me. I told her that. And I hope you think of your spouse the same way. When we start thinking of our money as just one of the countless good gifts from our Father who loves us, we can rest in the knowledge that he knows what we need. He promises to provide, and his storehouse are unending. Catch this one here. See if I can find it. In my notes here. Find anything, I can't see it. Oh, here it is, here it is. The dollar said to the dime, you are a shiny, valueless little runt. The dime said to the dollar, but I go to church more often than you do. Wow. Wow. <sighs> Generosity isn't one and done situation. It's lifestyle. You don't do it one time and then that's it. I gave my 5,000 to missions. When was that? Five years ago? I've done my part. Pray about being radical in giving and, and being generous. Have you ever considered our Lord's radical generosity towards us? For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that through though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. I'm rich because of him. I have good health because of him. Don't you agree? Amen. I want to hear some amens this morning. I don't want to be the only one. <laughs> we are what we are because of Jesus Christ, folks. Let's face up to it. And let's pray to him every day and thank him. Even during the day when you come across something that comes to you, pray and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you. Thank you that it rained. When I went through that, that water with my truck that time, I told you about the example coming up over here, didn't know there was any flood, and came down and there was water. This deep, at least. And my truck was going on the other side of the truck, out of the road. I could tell it tipping, and I couldn't see, and I just turned my wheel, just a and I, it's just like something lift me up, put me in the center of the road, and Jerry and I went right down the road, out of that deep water. That don't just happen. That's God leading me. And when I went out of that, Mike was right there, and I said, Mike, thank the Lord. I said, thank you, Jesus. You saved me. It was because of you that I'm through this. And then the next day, go and look at my truck, and there's grass all over the side of me. Yeah, that means I was down there to pick up grass off the, out of the ditch. Phil says, Ooh. She says, you need God with you all the time. The way you drive, the way you do. I, I agree with that. Radical generosity is the giving of all your time, talent, and treasures for the sake of God's kingdom and the heavenly reward without expecting any earthly return on investment. What does a life of radical generosity look like? Let me tell you one. Consider David Green, founder of Hobby Lobby. Everybody's heard of Hobby Lobby. Today, Green is worth an estimated $5.8 billion. I see their trucks everywhere. The 81st richest man in America, according to the magazine, or Forbes magazine. But Green's story of generosity began in his garage in 1970 when he and his wife Barbara began making picture frames. After many years of dreaming and hard work, they turned their initial plan into the largest privately owned arts and craft retailer in the world today. Today, Hobby Lobby does 
four billion in, er, in yearly sales and employs more than 30,000 people in 47 states. I did not know that. I didn't know they were so widespread all throughout America. Every year, Green and his family give away 50% of their company's profits. It is estimated that he's given away upwards of 500 million in his lifetime, buying and donating land and properties to different organizations, ministries around the world. He also has helped funded the worldwide delivery of more than 1.4 billion copies of the gospel literature. Now, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful to do that to others, to help others? I tell you, that, that, that really made me feel good. The driving force behind green generosity is a vision of something bigger than this life. I want to know that I have affected people for eternity. Oh, that's what I want to be. I believe I am. I believe once someone knows Christ as a personal savior, I have affected eternity, he says. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, that's wonderful. Make sure you're moving towards your treasure. Many people are familiar with the following words of Jesus. Do not lay up for yourself treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, where your heart will be also. Matthew 6, 19, 21. Far few of us are initially are, are intimately familiar with these wise words from the Apostle Paul. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud, not to trust in their money, which it is so unreliable. That's true. Unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. Where is that found? 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 19. Isn't that good counsel? Oh, that's wonderful. You may not think of yourself as rich, but you are. Oh, I'm not rich. I'm living on government assistance. Oh, I'm on Social Security. Look at my age. Oh, please don't look at my age. Folks, don't look at my age. This is October. October's an exciting month, right? Why is that, Dan? Why is October an exciting month? <laughs> see, see, see what answer I get from him. <laughs> Transition month. Yeah, that's right. And my birthday is in October. That's what it is. I thought you knew that. <laughs> no, no, I told someone the other day that I start singing happy birthday the first. Why that? Well, I want the family to remember that my birthday is in October. Don't want to forget. Oh, wonderful. We'll get together then. Okay, a lot of people say, I'm not rich. According to the magazine, a typical person in the bottom 5% of America income distribution is still richer than 68% of the world's inhabitants. We're pretty rich. 5% com compared to 68. No matter what's your income, you are either moving away from your treasure or towards it. Lord Jesus Christ gave us a choice in the matter. Every heartbreak brings us one moment closer to eternity. If we selfishly spend our lives in the pursuit of wealth on earth, then we waste our lives. Did you get that thought, that sentence? That is astounding. Song. If we selfishly pursue our life to make money, we're wasting our life. But if you're treasure in heaven, you are always moving towards it. Catch this one. Bestseller Stephen King shared these words with the graduating class a few years ago. 
A couple of years ago, I found out, this, I'm going to read what he had, but this is good. A couple of years ago, I found out what you, can, you can't take it with you means. A couple of years ago, I found out what you can't take it with you means. I found out that while I was lying in a ditch at, at the side of a country road, covered with mud, blood, and with uh, my right leg poking out the side of my jeans like a branch of a tree taken down in a thunderstorm. I had a master card in my wall. But when you're lying in a ditch with broken glass in your hair, no one accepts master card. <laughs> oh, that's good. We come in naked and broke. We may be dressed when we go out, but we're just as broke. Warren Buffett, that's what you put here, going to go out broke. Bill Gates, going to go out broke. Going out broke, Tom Hanks. Going out broke, Steve King, broke. Not a crying dime. All the money you earn, all the stocks you buy, all the mutual funds you trade, all of that is mostly smoke and mirrors. It will still be, it, it, it's, it's still going to be a quarter past getting late, whether you tell the time on a Timex or a Rolex. So I want you to consider making your life one long gift to others. Why not? All you have is on loan in a way. All that lasts is what you pass on. This needy world, not a pretty picture, but we have the power to help, the power to change. And why should we refuse? Because we're going to take it with us? Oh, please. That's what you put it there. Oh, please. A life of giving, not just money, but time and spirit repays. It helps us remember that we're maybe going out broke, but right now we're doing okay. Right now, we have the power to do great good for others and for ourselves. So I ask you to begin by giving, to continue as you begin. I think you'll find in the end that you've got more than you ever had and did more good than you ever dreamed. That's his speech to the graduating class. You'll find you had more than you thought and you're doing more good by giving. Oh, be generous, be kind, be considerate of others, as our text says. Be, be uh, good, generous. Got one more little story I want to bring to you. Um, there, are, there are three types of givers. The flint, the sponge, and the honeycomb. To get anything out of the flint, you have to, you get it from hammering it, you know, sparks off. Then you only get chips and sparks. To get water out of a sponge, you have to squeeze it. The more you squeeze, the more you get. But the honeycomb simply overflows with sweetness. When a person understands what God has done for them, you, you, don't, you don't have to prime them to, to give, and, and you don't need ten collections. They understand that he is a great God. In fact, at offering time, we ought to jump to our feet and applaud that we are here to give, ha have something to give, and have been blessed. I never thought of that. We ought to jump to and say, thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord, that I have something in my billfold to give you this morning because you have been so good all week to me. You understand? Yes, we are blessed. We ought to just applaud the privilege of giving. God has been so good to us. And in close, I want to bring you this, this text, Philippians 1.6. I am praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. We ought to thank him every day and share it with others. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful 
So thankful. What a wonderful God you have. I tell you, we just, I just don't, can't say the words how much I appreciate you in each of our lives. I experience you in my life. I hear your voice many times. Let me listen to that voice. Let me do what you say and experience your love and your guidance in my life. Bless this church. Bless each member. Bless each one that's here and those that are missing. And help us to be united in this cause and generosity and goodness, goodness to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For our closing song, I found it in a songbook. And when I talked to Dan last night, I said, I don't know if we know it, but the words are outstanding. 639, song number 639. Now, if, if I have trouble singing it up here, I know somebody I'm going to uh, ask to come up here. <laughs> he said he, he knows it. Jerry, if you want to come up and, and fiddle with it or whatever you want to do, I don't know. 639. I don't know if you know it, Jerry. But it has such a good meaning. It goes along with our sermon, our thought. 630. Come here, Jim. a wonderful song. The words just really sink in my heart. Our Father in Heaven, as we come to close, this is our dedication to you. We want to be this way, in every way, in service for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.